Hello, everybody, and welcome to the AAN's Virtual Resident Education Lecture Series. This month's topic is Neurocritical Care, or is titled Neurocritical Care's Greatest Hits. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Angela Hayes Sapshak. Is, she is an Associate Professor of Neurology and Anesthesiology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where she serves as the Director of Neurocritical Care Fellowship Program, as well as the Associate Director of the Neurology Residency Program. Dr. Hayes Sapshak has been active in graduate medical education for more than 15 years and has served in several leadership roles at local and national levels. She's the current chair of the NCS Accreditation Certification and Training Committee, the ACT, as well as the immediate past chair of the fellowship director section. In addition, she has served on the ACGME Neurocritical Care Milestones Task Force the Society for Critical Care Medicine, Critical Care as a Specialty Task Force, and she currently serves on the Board of Directors of the United Council of Neurological Specialties. Accompanying Dr. Shapshak is Dr. Ranjit Perez uh, Krishnam. He is originally from Bangalore, India, where he had completed medical school. He is currently a PGY-4 neurology resident at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and will be a neurocritical fellow at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. His area of interest include SAH and neuro monitoring. Dr. Shapshak and Dr. Krishnam, we are so happy to have you here. Please feel free to begin. All right, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the introduction, Ben, and I'd like to thank the AAN for giving us the opportunity to present today. Briefly, I have no um, real relevant financial disclosures for this talk. I um, receive a small amount of salary support from the NIH for some ICH-related grants, but we're actually not going to touch on ICH. Um, I will mention that I do serve as an advisory member for uh, the local organ procurement organization, uh, which uh, may be relevant to some of the um, brain death discussion, but it is not. Um, it's a volunteer position, so there are no financial conflicts. So Sanchez and I thought we would run through um, a couple of sort of illustrative cases that, uh, you know, walk through the neuro ICU um, with a fair degree of regularity and use those to illustrate uh, some of the key principles that we deal with in the ICU on an ongoing basis. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Sanjay tell us about our first case. All right. So we have our first case. It's a case of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, but all right. So it's a 36-year-old white male uh, with an unknown past medical history presents to the hospital after witnessed out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, they did three rounds of ACLS, achieved ROSC, and the vitals were as follows. MAP of 65, heart rate of 102, O2 sats were 95%, and the temperature was 38.6. His GCS was three, pupils were fixed, uh, and there was no gag, gag cough for corneal reflexes, and the labs were concerning for an AKI and an anion gap at polyca acidosis. Uh, going to the next slide, we can see that CICU then calls us for a consult. And the question is, can we declare him brain dead yet as of now? So this is one of the spots where we had a poll question that we were going to try. So I don't know if uh, Ben can help us get the poll. Ah, there we are. So I'm interested to hear the responses from the audience. So who thinks... Uh, the answer to this question is yes, he's absolutely brain dead versus no, he's absolutely going to get better or not yet. All right, good. So, so far we have two respondents. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Excellent. So we'll let the answers keep rolling in. Um, I'm So we've got one person who thinks he's totally going to get better, which I appreciate the optimism. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and walk through the case with you. Um, if I can make the, uh, once again, my, um, there we go. Okay. So uh, just to talk a little bit about when a brain death evaluation is appropriate. So um, the there are several prerequisites that you have to satisfy before you can even um, open a discussion about whether or not a patient is brain dead. So the first is that the person has to have a known irreversible cause of their coma. Um, and the second stipulation that goes along with that is that there has to be an adequate waiting period. So the challenge is that there, for you know, reasons that I think should be obvious, haven't really been any large randomized trials about what really is um, an adequate waiting period. 
Um, but I can tell you that the consensus is emerging that for a normothermic patient after a cardiac arrest, a minimum of 28 hours is, or 24 hours is required. So this is not a conversation that we're going to have um, immediately after someone like this has been um, admitted. Um, the second major criteria that you need to fulfill is you have to be um, relatively certain that there's no um, uh, metabolic or um, drug-related um, confounder for the clinical exam. Um, and one of the biggest ones we talk about is the um, possible um, presence of a CNS depressant drug. And the, the recommendation from the last set of AAN guidelines is that if the person has been exposed to some kind of a sedative um, or other CNS depression, that you should wait for five half-lives, which if you do the math actually winds up being a lot longer than you think in some situations. Um, and you have to expect exclude any clinically significant electrolyte, acid base, or endocrine disturbance. And as uh, Sanjus mentioned, um, when we went over the case, this person has a couple of electrolyte abnormalities and an AKI going on that may be relevant. Um, so other factors that don't really pertain in this case include uh, the person has to be hemodynamically stable. Um, they can't be hypothermic, um, and you have to um, exclude certain confounders, including cervical spine injury, orbital fractures, um, and other um, potential um, uh, brain death mimics, including uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome and ALS. So um, the last round of the A um, AAN guidelines were published in 2010. Um, it, excitingly, uh, there is a new version that is um, has been um, proposed and developed, and I am told is going to be published on October 11th. So stay tuned. Um, we're excited to uh, uh, have um, that document coming out actually very soon. Um, I was able to review an, a kind of a preliminary version um, that went out for public comment, and there are some interesting changes, including the recommendation that we avoid EEG. Um, and they did actually specifically um, in the preliminary version recommend um, uh, kind of codifying the 24-hour waiting period after a hypoxic arrest. So that'll be, um, a, 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 if it survived the uh, review period, that um, may be a new addition to the upcoming version. So keep an eye out for that, uh, which should be available in a little bit less than a month. So we, let me make sure I'm not skipping a slide. So if we, we kind of went through the um, poll a minute ago, and I saw that some of you had, had started answering the second question as well. I don't know if I can see the responses to that, but the, um, the next question we had is if we're not going to declare this patient brain dead, what is the best next step? I don't know if I can see. I can I, tell you now it's a uh, it's evenly split across every answer. Oh really? So that's really <laughs> interesting. So um, you, you can have a conversation about prognosis this early. I'd be cautious within the first 24 or 48 hours or so about um, you know being too definitive about your um, your comments for what we're going to talk about. Um, I would not uh, recommend going forward with a cerebral perfusion study because so that that is a confirmatory or ancillary test that we often use in cases where we think somebody is brain dead, but I think it would be premature in this case for the reasons that we discussed. Um, this person is still within first 24 hours. Um, and really the um, ancillary tests that we do to help confirm a brain death diagnosis um, are um, secondary to the clinical exam. So it, it you, probably shouldn't be embarking on that whole discussion unless you've already satisfied the prerequisites for a brain death declaration and you have a clinical exam that is consistent with that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the possibility of, um, a, you know, the prognostic utility about MRI and uh, what you should do in terms of targeted temperature management, which is what TTM stands for. So, Moving on to targeted te temperature management, this was kind of the hot new thing, um, you know, in the early 2000s, um, based on two relatively small studies where they took patients with out of hospital cardiac arrest who had an initial shockable rhythm, so VFib or VTAC, and they randomized them to um, controlled hypothermia to 33 degrees versus usual care. Um, and these uh, two original studies demonstrated a significant, um, statistically significant improvement and clinically significant improvement in um, outcomes um, based on the cerebral performance category, which is similar to the modified rank. And it's a you know outcome measure that's used in a lot of cardiac arrest trials. Uh, this is a picture of a um, uh, one of the intravascular cooling devices that uh, you know was popular for use at the time. Um, but since the early 2000s, when those uh, studies came out, there have been several subsequent studies. So probably the, the, um, the two that are most important to know about are the TTM, or Targeted Temperature Management 1 and 2 trials. So TTM1 came out in 2013. 
Um, they had almost a thousand patients compared to about 200 for the smaller studies. Um, and they randomized them to targeted temperature management at 33 degrees versus 36 degrees. So this is relevant because the control arm and the earlier studies had been basically, you know, not paying any attention to the temperature at all in the control arm, or at least not in a protocolized fashion. Uh, whereas this was really, um, you know, both patients got target or both arms got targeted temperature management, but they changed the target um, range or the, the goal temperature. Um, and what they found in this study was that there was no significant difference in mortality or in functional outcomes. Um, the Capital Chill trial um, in 2021 did a, a little bit different take on it where they looked at, um, you know, taking it down to severe instead of moderate hypothermia. Um, and in this case, again, they didn't find any difference in outcomes. Um, but this one over here on the left side of the screen is the TTM2 trial, which came out in 2021. Um, and this was an interesting study because they loosened up um, some of the inclusion criteria compared to the earlier trials. Um, so it um, it didn't have to necessarily be a witnessed arrest. It didn't necessarily have to be a shockable rhythm, um, although they did exclude patients that were found down where the initial rhythm was asystole. Um, and the patients were randomized to 33 degrees uh, or targeted normothermia. So everybody got targeted temperature management. It's just a question of whether they were uh, normothermic or hypothermic. Um, and what they found that there was uh, a numerical benefit for hypothermia, but it was not statistically benefit, uh, st a statistically significant benefit when you looked at mortality. Um, there was no difference at all in the functional outcomes, and there was a significant um, increase in arrhythmias with hemodynamic compromise in the patients that were taken to 33 degrees. Um, so I think in the wake of this trial, a lot of enthusiasm for um, therapeutic hypothermia in the cardiac arrest um, patients have has fallen off, at least among, you know, the people that I commonly talk to. Um, but it's still a thing, you know, a lot of a lot of institutions have built up their hypothermia teams or their hypothermia protocols over the years. So it's still something you might run into, um, at least till this study gets a little bit more widely publicized. So going back to the case, if we were to look and we'll see that we recommend a goal of 36 degrees, continuous EEG monitoring, and we wait for at least 72 hours for prognostication. But the CICU attending decides to do 33 degrees instead, propol and fentanyl for sedation. And uh, we wait, uh, rewarmed to about 36.5 hours, uh, 50 hours post arrest. And despite that, you see that the 72 hour exam uh, has pupils are fixed, dilated, absent corneals, absent gog, gag and co cough reflex, and no responses, no response to uh, central pain as well. So next, what would you say we should do, Dr. Chakra? Yeah, so one of the things I want to point out that I, I think is um, kind of under-discussed in um, uh, particularly neurology programs is the effect that hypothermia can have on uh, drug metabolism. So this is a study um, that, or a, a figure that was published in a continuum article um, from a study looking at this in patients that were treated with uh, moderate hypothermia, where they measured propofol concentrations over time. And what you can see is that the cold group uh, had significantly higher um, propofol concentration uh, in their blood for a, a you know, given dose of medication compared to patients that were normal thermic, um, suggesting that our patients that are sedated um, with propofol uh, during their hypothermia, um, that Five, whole five half-lives things that, that we talked about might be significantly longer um, in their case because the drug metabolism is slowed for patients that are hypothermic. Um, so we mentioned that our patient was also sedated with fentanyl, which is fairly common. Um, and there's this concept called the context-sensitive half-life that is, you know, our anesthesia colleagues are taught, but I don't think most of us uh, necessarily are exposed to this unless, you know, it's buried in the, in the, um, a deep part of the hippocampus where all of our um, med school pharmacology uh, still lives. But what I want you to look at is this yellow line here. Um, this is the time required for plasma levels for uh, to drop um, by half in minutes. Um, and the yellow line is fentanyl. Um, so we're all taught that fentanyl is a short acting drug and it, it is if we give it as an IV push. Um, but when you start running it in as an infusion, that changes the pharmacodynamics in such a way that the half-life becomes markedly prolonged over time. Uh, so somebody who's been on a fentanyl infusion for several days, uh, regardless of what their body temperature is, uh, the time frame for elimination is going to be significantly prolonged out to almost a one-to-one 
um, you know, in terms of time to um, infuse time of infusion um, and the time to elimination. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And a lot of um, pharmacologists believe that fentanyl also um, is a uh, hangs around longer in patients that are hypothermic, although we don't have, um, you know, a really elegant study to show that as we do with um, propofol. Um, so use caution uh, in your patients that may have been treated with therapeutic hypothermia when, um, you know, making prognostic statements, especially if they've been sedated, and especially if you're talking about embarking on a brain death um, uh, evaluation. Um, and I'm going to let Sanja tell us a little bit more about the decision making uh, for patients that are not brain dead about what you're going to tell the family about prognosis. And I think another thing to add, Dr. Shafrak, was uh, a lot of the times that we patients that we see in the ICU, they also have like renal dysfunction, hepatic dysfunction. So the half lives vary even in that particular situation for your elimination. It's probably always a good idea to always get pharmacists involved to try and figure out exactly what that five half lives would be given those dysfunctions. And that's actually one of the things that, uh, sorry, I, I interrupted you. Oh, no, I was just saying that's an excellent point. Uh, so now uh, going back to the case, if the patient kind of met brain death criteria, then we have an answer. Technically, they're legally brain dead. And there are some state to state differences with regards to uh, what that brain death entails. But for the most part, if you have an answer with regards to brain death, then yes, we have an answer. Uh, but the next question would be, let's say they failed on one of the things with the brain death exam. They are, uh, they have a cough reflex. Uh, they have a pupillary reflex. They have some sort of a motor response, which is not a reflex response, but we do think it's a uh, response with regards to pain or any other form of stimulus. So what do we do next? Uh, this is something, this is a very complicated question to answer. Honestly, there's not a lot of evidence out there, but uh, there, there have been a couple of societies which have tried to come up with guidelines for these. And uh, it's very important to remember that these are guidelines. So these are expert opinion and we don't have necessary, you know, uh, we, we don't have like definitive answers. Uh, but one of the guidelines that came out was the Can Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines. It came out earlier this year. And that basic idea was do a, a post dissertation care, wait for at least uh, 48 hours. And between that 48 hours to five days is that when we start doing neuroprognostication. Uh, and the main idea being uh, try to delay it for at least 72 hours post the uh, arrest. And if you are doing any sort of target temperature management, then 72 hours post cooling uh, and return to normal temperature, return to normothermia. And that's when you start using all of these approaches. And the main Thing that you would look at is neurological exam. You would try to use any ancillary testing such as EEG, CT, MRI, and also use things like SSEPs um, with the idea of trying to give them uh, an answer as to what exactly you need to do with regards to prognosis. So uh, one of the things, if you can go to the next slide, you see that the NCS Society actually came up with uh, their own set of guidelines, which kind of talks a little bit about which of these are going to be uh, point towards a good outcome, which of these signs are going to point towards a poor outcome. And for the most part, uh, what they found out was at any point of time, if the patient is showing signs of awakening, so either during the rewarming period or any time during the uh, uh, post-resuscitation period, if they show any signs of awakening, then that's actually a good sign. Uh, and the idea being that mo about 50% of the patients post cardiac arrest, they, re they uh, become responsive in about 24 hours. And about 80 to 90% of the patients become responsive by around 72 hours. And that's why one of the good practice statements is to wait for at least 72 hours post arrest and post ROSC to start doing any sort of neuroprognostication because they might just wake up. Beyond that, some of the other things which have which show good outcome. Again, there are limited studies and the TTM trial was one of the things that showed this was uh, uh, MRI findings. If the MRI finding showed restricted diffusion in very small area or no evidence of restricted diffusion, then there are good outcomes for that. And another thing is if the EEG does not have any sort of a malignant EEG pattern, like a birth suppression pattern or any sort of epileptic form activity, which is which cannot be controlled. If it does not show that there, and if there is any evidence of continuous e, uh, on continuous EEG monitoring, if you see a continuous EEG pattern and it shows reactivity, then all of those things would again point towards 
good outcome. An important thing to consider here is that when we talk about outcome, we're talking about neurological outcome. And that would mean what is the outcome at three months or what is the outcome at six months and what is their neurological outcome? So at any point of time, if they're having any other comorbid things going on, like if they have AKI, if they have uh, 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 liver failure, any of those other things going on, then that's going to be a separate entity altogether. Now, when it when we talk about poor outcomes, it's they've kind of talked about which of these uh, indicators would be reliable and which of these predictors are not reliable. And uh, based on the criteria that they use, which was they wanted to look at how many of these predictors had a low false positive rate, meaning uh, how many of these predictors would accurately say that this the this particular predictor had a poor outcome. And they found that uh, only two, which is absence of pupillary light reflexes and also absence of the N N20 wave on the SSEPs, those at beyond 48 hours, those are the only two things which were found to be reliable. Again, there was less evidence for this. So it's, you know, take, take what you can from this. But beyond that, some of the other things which were considered moderately reliable would be the loss of gray white differentiation beyond 48 hours, uh, and even MRI showing loss of gray white differentiation and diffusion restriction in the two to seven day period, and also birth suppression pattern on EEG was found to be mod was found to be a moderately reliable predictor for poor outcome. Other things which were not reliable were age, initial cardiac rhythm, uh, time to ROSC, corneal reflexes were also found to be not reliable, and motor response, uh, if it was absent or extensive motor response was not found to be reliable. And uh, one thing which kind of differs between the NCS guidelines and the Canadian uh, guidelines were this uh, was the presence of myoclonus. And the main reason being uh, the NCS found uh, NCS found that the studies which have which looked at myoclonus had uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy uh, bias going on where you basically, find myoclonus, tell them that they don't have good prognosis, and then you do withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy, and hence you basically prove that they have poor prognosis, which is kind of like circular and doesn't really explain things. Now, with regards to the studies which actually did look at long-term outcomes, there were very, very few studies which looked at myoclonus, and hence myoclonus within those 48 hours was found not to be a very reliable indicator of poor outcome. And neuron-specific inlays, even that was found not to be a very reliable indicator of poor outcome. Based on all of these, uh, NCS came up with a flowchart, which we can go on the next uh, flowchart as to what we can do with regards to helping predict uh, uh, the prognosis. And the main idea being they relied on presence of motor response, MRI, EEG, and SSCPs to say, okay, the patient has good outcome. And in throughout this entire thing, the language that they use to explain to the patients was always, uh, you always need to mention that there is a cer certain degree of uncertainty that goes into this. Excellent. Yeah. So I think the uh, take home point for those of you that wanted to get a stat MRI when we asked the question about the case um, is that an MRI within the first 48 hours is probably not going to be that helpful. Um, unlike the acute ischemic stroke patients, you don't expect to see um, the relevant findings that early. Uh, although the MRI um, between day two and day seven can be somewhat helpful um, in the right um, clinical setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and again, if the MRI is taken for etiology purposes, then that's completely different. But purely for a prognostication perspective, two to seven days for MRI uh, beyond 72 hours for CT. Excellent. So do you want to go into our second case? Sure. So the next case, we've got a 28-year-old gentleman involved in a motorcycle accident, not wearing a helmet. He was intubated in the field, arrives as a level one trauma, and GCS is three uh, absent corneals intubated on the field. So this is three key. CSF, otoria present on the right side. Uh, vital signs show that his blood pressure is 90 over 40, he's tachycardic to 138, 84% saturation on 60% FiO2. So what uh, would... Yeah, I think we are ready for our next poll questions. Good. So uh, we can answer the first question now. We'll get to the second question in another slide or two. So our options are in terms of what are the best next steps we can... Uh, check ocleocephalics, check cold calorics, um, increase the FiO2, uh, get an ICP monitor or a STAT EEG. 
All right. I, I love this because, um, well, okay, a minute ago we had literally nobody that was choosing the right answer, but now uh, we've got um, two of you. So uh, so I'm, I'm happy to hear that. But the correct answer in this case is increase the FiO2. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about why if I can make the slides advance. Um, <laughs> what, what was that, Sanja? ABCs. ABCs, yeah. So I, I agree with obtaining an ICP monitor, but that would be the um, the next thing I would do. I would absolutely not check the oculocephalics because this guy had a significant traumatic brain injury and the, the likelihood of um, some kind of comorbid spine um, injury is actually pretty high. Um, so you wouldn't want to do anything involving manipulation of the neck until that the C-spine had been cleared. Um, and I noticed that nobody um, wanted to check cold calorics. But if you notice in the vignette, I mentioned that that guy has CSF otorrhea. Um, so that would actually be a, a reason not to want to irrigate his um, ear with cold saline because you would end up um, irrigating the middle temporal fossa. Um, so uh, the Brain Trauma Foundation is the um, sort of the go-to organization for guidelines about how to manage severe TBI, and I've put their uh, website down here at the bottom of the slide. Um, the current set of uh, severe TBI guidelines that we're in is the fourth edition, um, and they do something a little bit different from some other organizations where this is sort of updated continuously, so they call it a living document. Um, so the current, um, uh, the kind of the pathophysiology of um, traumatic brain injury and a lot of other um, uh, entities that we see in neurocritical care has to do, um, re sort of revolves around the discussion of intracranial hypertension. Um, so we tend to see this mostly in structural lesions such as subdural, epidural, or um, in patients with hydrocephalus, but you can see it in um, other causes of diffuse cerebral edema, including fulminant liver failure, which you might um, end up seeing as a neurology consultant in medical ICUs. So the reason um, that there's a couple of reasons that this is problematic, um, and I know most of you probably know about the Monroe Kelly doctrine, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but basically the um, skull is a rigid compartment, uh, which means that if, uh, you know, the volume cannot increase. So if you add anything to that space, the, the pressure is going to increase unless you're able to remove something else. Um, so under normal circumstances, the intracranial compartment is occupied by the brain, blood, and spinal fluid. Um, and if you start to add something else, like a big subdural hematoma, you've got to um, de remove something else in order to compensate, which is usually end up, uh, ends up being CSF that's extruded into the lumbar cisterns. Um, so as long as you can compensate for the added volume... Uh, by extruding CSF or maybe venous blood, you're on the flat part of this curve. But as soon as you get to the point where intracranial compliance is um, has been maximized, you start to see the ICP rise relatively steeply for any other change in volume. Um, so once you get to that point, you can run into this problem where um, the elevated intracranial pressure actually causes secondary brain injury through cerebral ischemia. Um, and that happens because of the relationship between ICP and cerebral perfusion pressure. Um, so the cerebral perfusion pressure is going to be determined by the mean arterial pressure minus the ICP. Um, and it, when cerebral autoregulation is intact, um, the cerebral blood flow is relatively constant for um, cerebral perfusion pressures that fall between about 50 and about 150 cc's. But when you fall off that scale, either below 50 or higher than 150, um, the, um, the, that relationship is lost and the intracranial vasculature becomes what we call pressure passive, um, meaning that when the IC or CPP falls to 40 or so, the um, cerebral perfusion is going to fall off steeply. And at numbers above about 150 or so, you're going to have um, a markedly increased cerebral blood flow, uh, which can lead to increased cerebral edema and possibly hemorrhage. Um, so it's important in these patients to target a cerebral perfusion pressure between um, about, you know, you, we usually target 60 to 70, specifically in the TBI population. Um, and so when you're when you see somebody in the acute period before you have an ICP monitor, one of the best things you can do to improve outcome is optimize the mean arterial pressure. Um, and uh, um, it, later in, in um, their hospital stay, the, the cerebral perfusion pressure is something that you're going to want to keep an eye on. Um, the other way that these intracranial mass lesions can cause um, pathology involves uh, developing pressure gradients across different compartments within the skull. 
Um, so the falks and the tent are very rigid. Um, and of course, the, the you know, bony structures surrounding the foramen magnum are also very rigid. And so the pressure gradient can be um, important in these situations. Um, so in the lower uh, diagram here, you see this person's got a in, uh, big intraparenchymal mass. And you can imagine that if you put in an ICP monitor on the contralateral side, that number might be normal, um, but that doesn't really mean that you're out of the woods because the pressure on the, um, in this case, the presumably the left side is probably significantly higher than it is on the right side. And that can result in subfalsing herniation, uncle herniation, uh, or other forms of um, tissue shifts that can result in additional tissue injury. So this isn't just an example of somebody with a large subdural who you can see has a lot of subfalsing herniation, probably also uncle herniation. So when we're dealing with a situation where you're worried about um, in a space occupying mass lesion and um, elevated intracranial pressure is something you're concerned about, uh, the first step is to um, find a surgeon who can remove any space occupying lesions that, that can be easily treated, such as the subdural on the earlier slide. Um, from a medical standpoint, the things we can do in the ICU involve reducing the volume of those intracranial contents that we talked about. So we can reduce brain volume, blood volume, or spinal fluid volume, um, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, or if all else fails, you can get a surgeon to come and open the skull. So um, to decrease the venous blood volume, there's a lot of sort of low-lying um, easy things that you can do, including making sure that the C collar is not too tight or that there's nothing else that's um, constricting venous outflow. Trendelenburg position is usually a bad idea for obvious reasons. So you want to elevate the head of the bed to promote um, venous blood drainage um, and optimize sedation and analgesia because if the person's gagging around the ET tube or has, um, you know, tight um, intra-abdominal pressures, that's going to um, impede venous outflow as well. As far as reducing brain volume, that's what we're really doing when we're talking about osmotherapy. Um, so I know most of you have probably heard about using mannitol or hypertonic saline to, quote, treat cerebral edema. Um, and we like to believe that that's what we're doing, but what we're really doing is reducing the, the brain water content uh, sort of throughout the um, intracranial space as opposed to really targeting um, the edema in the region that's um, suffered trauma, trauma or some other insult. Um, so what we're doing here is infusing a hypertonic substance to create an osmotic gradient across the blood-brain barrier. Um, and the caveat here is that this is only going to work when the blood-brain barrier is intact. Um, and in a lot of cases, for you know, instance, your large ischemic stroke or, or um, you know, presumably your TBI patients, the blood-brain barrier may not be intact um, throughout the uh, intracranial compartment. So the efficacy of um, your hypertonic um, agents is gonna depend on the reflection coefficient, which basically means the degree to which the blood-brain barrier is impermeable to the substance. So for mannitol, the reflection coefficient is 0.9, which is pretty good. For hypertonic saline, the reflection coefficient is one, which is ideal. Um, so mannitol, we usually give in a bolus. Uh, you can administer 0.5 to one grams per kg. Um, there are some neurosurgical um, studies that, you know, um, have demonstrated efficacy up to 1.5 grams per kg. Um, it's nice because you can give it through a peripheral. Um, it's relatively safe as long as you're not dealing with somebody who has um, impaired renal function. Um, but the chat, the thing you need to be aware of is it, is it is an osmotic diuretic. So it's going to lead to diuresis and you need to make sure that your patient doesn't become um, hypovolemic because hypotension and hypovolemia contribute to mortality in the um, TBI population. Um, as far as hypertonic saline goes, it's actually a volume expander, which is attractive. Um, if you start asking, um, you know, a bunch of neurointensivists how they administer this, the answers are going to be all over the map. Um, from a pathophysiological standpoint, it's probably makes more sense to do bolus administration. So, you know, you treat ICPs when they're high. Um, the challenge here is that the really concentrated stuff requires central access. So most centers you can push, um, 3% through a peripheral, but not all centers. Um, and anything more concentrated than that requires central access. Um, so for acute herniation, 23.4% um, is the favorite agent. Some people call that hot salt or a salt bomb, but that very definitely needs to be given through a central line and you have to push it slowly over about 10 to 15 minutes. So, um, when you talk about decreasing the blood volume in the arterial compartment, um, that is, uh, something that, you know, is kind of the the last medical thing that you can do before you start talking about um, more aggressive surgical intervention. Um, and the most commonly used methods for that are um, 
a, a pharmacologic coma. Um, so deep sedation, usually with barbiturates, or at least that's the most studied agent. Um, and that suppresses cerebral function, which um, decreases cerebral blood flow as a um, basically a side effect um, and targeted temperature management. So people don't really do hypothermia anymore because there was a, a large study that showed that while it was effective for treating ICP, it lead, led to an increase um, in um, infectious complications that wound up, um, you know, uh, overbalancing any potential benefit. Um, but I did want to mention hyperventilation real quick. Um, so hyperventilation is very powerful. Um, if you've got somebody that, you know, blows a pupil and you're on the way to the OR to do the decompression, you can hyperventilate them on the way and, and that can potentially be life-saving. Um, but the challenge is that it's a very short-lived effect. Um, so the choroid plexus does a really good job of buffering um, the pH within the spinal fluid, and it's the pH that really leads to vasoconstriction. Um, so if you hyperventilate for an extended period of time, you can actually exacerbate cerebral ischemia, um, and you'll you'll lose any potential benefit after um, you know minutes to hours. Um, so this is not a long-standing solution uh, to somebody with an intracranial mass lesion. It's really a temporizing measure uh, while you're getting your hot salt from pharmacy or waiting for a neurosurgery consult. Is that um, a particular PaCO2 that you would target when you're trying to do hyperventilation for these patients and something that you would not cross? Um, good question. Um, so I would, you know, for people that um, I'm managing in the ICU where I'm not trying to do um, hypotherm or hyperventilation for um, ICP, I usually target around 35 to 40. So on the low end of normal. Um, if you have an entitled CO2 monitor while you're um, dealing with an acute uh, ICP crisis, I might target something around 25 to 30, but I don't think I would go a whole lot lower than that. Um, so for those of you that put um, placing an ICP monitor, um, the uh, that is a reasonable next step. Um, so the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines um, uh, recommend that with level 2B evidence um, that uh, using a... Uh, ICP monitor uh, can uh, reduce in-hospital mortality and uh, two-week post-injury mortality. Um, what it doesn't do is um, a whole lot else, really. It doesn't improve functional outcomes. And uh, this is um, a very interesting study called the BEST TRIP trial that I, I won't spend too much time on because I'm running a little bit over for this section. But um, essentially what they did was they used, uh, you know, U.S. investigators ran a trial in a low resource settings, so Bolivia and Ecuador. Um, in the U.S., you couldn't really do a trial of ICP monitoring and TBI because it's standard of care. Um, but in a lot of these studies, in Bolivia and Ecuador, uh, or these um, low resource settings such as Bolivia and Ecuador, um, uh, a lot of patients with severe traumatic brain injury didn't receive much care at all because the, the chance of survival or recovery was so poor. Um, so in this study, they um, randomized people to either an ICP monitor or uh, medical management using other markers of um, elevated intracranial pressure, such as um, radiographic um, findings and the clinical exam. And what they found was that there was really no difference in long-term outcomes, um, but the patients that did receive an ICP monitor received fewer interventions um, and had a um, shorter length of stay. So they ended up, uh, you know, the people with um, who used the exam and imaging to detect um, intracranial um, catastrophe or intracranial worsening um, did just as well, but they ended up receiving more treatment and needed closer monitoring, so a higher resource utilization. Um, so this is very interesting and has not changed practice in um, uh, the U.S. for the most part, but I think it's important to note that, um, you know, it's not so much the monitor uh, that ends up being um, life-saving or, or outcome um, affecting, it, it's what you do with the information. Um, so to get back to the question that we asked before, um, you know, I, I didn't really touch on as much as I wanted, but really the answer to that question was that you wanted to increase the FiO2 um, because the what we're dealing with at this point in somebody who's already um, experienced a severe TBI um, is we're trying to prevent secondary brain injury. Um, and that patient was hypoxic. So 84% on 60% FiO2 and hypo hypoxia and hypotension are really tied to poor outcome in this population because of the, um, the you know, high demand for um, uh, oxygen in the intracranial compartment, particularly when the patient is injured. So the first thing you got to do in that situation is fix the hypoxia or the hypotension if the patient has it, and then you can worry about ICP monitoring and all the other things. All right. So moving forward with our case, uh, we consult neurosurgery, EVD is placed. The ICP is noted to be about 35 uh, and sustained at 35. 
the MAP is 76, uh, patient is deeply sedated, sodium level is 160, PSO2 is 33. Uh, the rest of the labs are fine. So what would the next step be in order to manage this patient? And we have a poll. Yeah, I don't know if uh, Ben can put it back up for us or not. Oh, there it is. So, nope, that's the subarachnoid case. Can we go back to, uh, let me see, we can view results. There we go. Um, so we have some people that want to do an EEG. I love an EEG, and that could be helpful in this case. So 48% 40, of the patients said start vasopressors to achieve a MAP of greater than 95. That is the correct answer because that's going to get our CPP up above that minimum level of 50. Um, and ideally, you want to get it to uh, around 60 or so. So uh, congratulations to the 48% the of you who chose that option. Um, the other things are not necessarily wrong. Um, so cisatricurium, um, you know, might arguably decrease the um, ICP by relaxing the intra-abdominal muscles and promoting venous outflow, although that's not really evidence-based. Um, it's uh, not a bad idea to check ammonia and LFTs just to make sure there's not something else confounding your exam. Um, and certainly trauma patients can occasionally get um, venous sinus thrombosis as well. So I don't really disagree with any of the other options. Um, but the most immediate um, thing that you can do to help save this patient is going to be to get the map up. So as far as the CPP goes, um, one of the things I want to share with you is that I, you know, I mentioned that um, the you know, CPP is relatively constant between, or blood flow is relatively constant between a CPP of 50 to 150 if autoregulation is intact. But it's important to note that in patients uh, with traumatic brain injury or subarachnoid, autoregulation may not be intact. So there's been a lot of uh, interest in the neurocritical care world over the past 10 years or so looking at when autoregulation fails. Um, one measure of this is called the um, PRX, um, which is uh, basically just the reactivity index. Um, and that basically looks at the association between the ICP and the mean arterial pressure, uh, where if it's positive, the patient is autoregulating, and if it's negative, they are pressure passive, which means autoregulation has failed. There are other ways you can measure this. Some centers are using TCD, uh, um, uh, near infrared spectrometry, spectrometry and other measures of cerebral blood flow that I'll, um, I don't really have time to discuss in any detail. Um, but the upshot is that when um, the patient becomes pressure passive, this relationship that you see where the, um, the cerebrovascular um, blood vessels are constricting as blood pressure goes up, um, ends up failing. So instead of the uh, getting vasoconstriction as the blood flow increases, you start to get vasodilation and that can increase ICP paradoxically. So that's important to recognize because when we're trying to treat to CPP guided therapy, meaning we, um, you know, we raise the ICP uh, or raise the mean arterial pressure to maintain the CPP above that threshold. Um, what we find is that um, it, it benefits people when autoregulation is intact. So if you think about it, driving the blood pressure up artificially um, will uh, lead to increased vasoconstriction, um, which will cause um, a decreased cerebral blood volume, which lowers ICP. Um, so that's beneficial. But if autoregulation fails, then what happens is the higher you push the cerebral perfusion pressure, the higher the ICP is going to get. So if you see somebody in the setting of an acute neurological emergency that's not responding to your therapy the way you want, you need to step back and, and question whether um, a, a different strategy might be more effective. And that's been um, something that we're learning more about um, in neurocritical care every year. Um, so I don't have, we're running a little bit over, um, but I mentioned that sort of the last ditch um, thing that you can do to try to save somebody who's failed um, uh, medical management of their high ICP is um, hemicraniectomy or, or decompression. Um, so why isn't that the first thing? Well, because of the DECRA trial. Um, so this is a trial looking at patients randomized within 72 hours of severe TBI um, to a bifrontal craniectomy like this. Um, so in this study, they did it early, so within 72 hours, um, and the patient had to have failed um, basically the first line interventions. So they had already gotten osmotherapy, sedation, analgesia, and perhaps an EVD, um, but they were still having high ICP spikes. So these patients went to surgery and they found lower ICPs and they were had fewer interventions, uh, including shorter ICU stays, um, but it did not lead to an improvement in outcome. 
I will say that the study was criticized because there was a little bit of an imbalance in the um, groups with potentially more um, severe injuries randomized to the surgical arm, uh, but for what it's worth, it was a negative trial. However, a, a later trial called Rescue ICP um, kind of did the same thing, except it was a different surgical procedure. Um, they did a decompressive hemicraniectomy, so a unilateral um, surgery. Um, and these patients had to fail stage two interventions as well, including things like um, barbiturates and um, targeted temperature management. Um, and so for those patients that had failed the more um, basically failed medical management that we, we pulled out all the stops and we still couldn't treat them. Um, they did find that when those patients went to surgery, they had improved outcomes, um, including a decrease in mortality in the surgical arm and an improvement in um, functional outcomes, both at um, six months and at a year. Um, so at this point in time, um, ICP or decompressive hemicraniectomy for your TBI patients is reserved for those who have failed medical management. Um, and in that case, it does seem to, uh, to be beneficial. Um, so I did mention that there's a lot of interest in sort of advanced neuromonitoring and multimodality neuromonitoring. Um, the BOOST-2 trial was a study of brain tissue oxygen, um, which proved that you can place a fiber optic bolt um, to measure brain tissue oxygen at the level of the extracellular fluid, basically. Um, uh, and you can, what you find when you do that is that it, it, you're able to um, titrate your cerebral perfusion pressure and other um, uh, physiologic variables that we can manipulate uh, in order to prevent these episodes of cerebral hypoxia. Um, so that's the, the line over here showing that those with the um, uh, the PBTO2 and the ICP monitor had fewer episodes of cerebral hypoxia, and it turned out to be safe. Uh, we do not have evidence that it improves outcome yet, but the BOOST-3 trial is ongoing, so that might be uh, something that we'll have um, shortly, I hope. Um, and the there was a trend toward improvement that was non-significant in the BOOST-2 trial, but it was not powered to uh, detect a statistical difference. Um, and there are any number of other um, non-invasive techniques that are gaining traction that unfortunately I'm not gonna have time to talk about. So I know we're running short on time, but we have one more case that, um, and for those of you that wanna stay over uh, and have a discussion, you're more than welcome. Um, but I'll let Sanjit go ahead and tell you about this 65 year old woman. Okay. A uh, 65-year-old woman presents uh, after complaining of the worst headache of her life. She uh, basically developed nausea, vomiting, uh, sudden onset. Uh, oh, what's it? Worst headache of her life. Worst Sorry. <laughs> Three days ago, uh, went to lie down, felt better the next day. And this morning, the headache occurred again. Uh, she briefly lost consciousness. Then there was some facial asymmetry noted. What would the next best step be? Refer to neurology clinic for migraine, CT, consult ortho for evaluation, or MRI. All right, good. So we are getting some answers coming in. And I think most people are choosing the correct answer, which would be a stat head CT. So you get the head CT, here it is. Yep, uh, head CT is performed, uh, the patient becomes more somnolent, now GCS is 12, uh, having increased nausea and vomiting. Vital signs show that blood pressure is 148 by 65, heart rate of 115, respiratory rate of 18, uh, and 93% on room air. What would the next step be? All right, good. good. So we've got some... Uh... Reports coming in. Uh, nobody wants to treat for status migranosis, so I'm glad to hear that. Um, we have uh, about half people want to um, consult neurosurgery for emergent EBD. Uh, we've got a few votes for intubation and a few votes for um, starting pressors uh, for cerebral perfusion. So I probably, under the circumstances, would not start um, vasopressors unless I knew that the ICP was through the roof. Um, I agree with starting with calling neurosurgery for an emergent EBD. Um, so this person here with the, um, uh, you can see enlarged temporal horns, you can see the uh, so-called um, white star of death or the blood outlining the basal or cisterns secondary to a ruptured aneurysm. Um, but hydrocephalus is probably the cause of the patient's design, decline in level of consciousness. And so that would be an indication for an emergent EBD. Um, at this point, we probably don't need to intubate just yet. She's, um, you know, we can 
she's setting reasonably well in room air, we can always add some supplemental oxygen. Um, and usually the threshold where you start to worry about airway protection is down around at a GCS of about eight or so. So we maybe have a little bit of room there. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily be wrong to give some Keppra, um, but we'll talk more briefly about that. So this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, as most of you have realized. Um, so this is something that um, we should have a high index of suspicion for, for our patients that come to the emergency department with an acute uh, severe headache. Um, a fair number of these are misdiagnosed, um, and often you they may present with kind of a sentinel headache or a sentinel bleed that may occur um, several days or so before their clinically significant bleed. Um, it's important to know that CT scan is extremely sensitive for picking up a subarachnoid hemorrhage, but that the sensitivity decreases with time. So these people that have a sentinel headache and then come in three or four days later, um, you may not actually, uh, the CT might actually be negative, um, and the sensitivity is only about 50% if it's seven days after the initial symptom onset. Um, LP works the other direction, so um, you can get a false negative within 12 hours because it just looks like a traumatic tap, um, but as time goes on, uh, the xanthochromia becomes easier and easier to detect, um, so those, uh, you know, sensitivity and specificity windows sort of overlap a little bit. Um, CTA is uh, any more in um, the, uh, uh, you know, U.S. in most centers with um, good scanners is about 95% sensitive if the aneurysm is bigger than about four millimeters. Um, and if you can get an MRI with susceptibility weighted imaging, that is extremely um, uh, sensitive for detecting a ruptured aneurysm as well. Um, but most of the published studies happen more than 24 hours after symptom onset. Um, so in terms of risks for aneurysm development, the two biggest modifiable risks are um, hypertension and cigarette smoking. Um, there's a whole list of um, non-modifiable risk factors, including um, sickle cell anemia and fibromuscular dysplasia that you sometimes see, uh, but I'm not going to read all of that. Um, there are two clinical grading scales, uh, or two basically versions of, of grading scales for subarachnoid hemorrhage. There are the clinical grading scales, and then there are the radiographic ones. Um, the clinical grading scales were developed to predict uh, mortality, and specifically mortality with open cranial surgery, um, but they do turn out to be probably the most um, powerful predictor of prognosis that we have. Um, so the two most commonly used ones are the Hunt-Hess scale and the World Federation of Neurological Surgeons scale, which is basically the Hunt-Hess scale, but the addition of GCS. Um, and these fours and fives down here that I put in the red box are the ones that we consider to be severe or high-grade subarachnoids, whereas the one, twos, and threes are, are generally um, not as sick. Often the patients with the GCS or with the Hunt-Hess three are the ones that have hydrocephalus, and they'll often improve when you... Um, uh, do some CSF diversion and come back into a like a one or a two category. So the radiographic grading scale that's sort of most commonly used now is the modified Fisher. Um, so this was originally developed to predict the risk for delayed ischemic neurological deficits or um, vasospasm. So the um, uh, grade one is just a thin um, uh, layer of blood in the basal cisterns. Uh, grade two is intraventricular hemorrhage, with or without a, a um, thin uh, subarachnoid clot. Grade three is the thick subarachnoid clot, which are much higher risk of um, vasospasm. And then the fours have the thick clot plus um, uh, intraventricular extension. Uh, and these have the highest rate of spasm at almost 40%. So I tend to think of subarachnoid management in three phases. Uh, so phase one is your patient where you're highly suspicious for a ruptured aneurysm that is unsecured, and the main threat to the patient then is going to be rebleeding. So we're going to focus on preventing that. Um, in the phase two patient, hopefully you've gotten somebody that can fix the aneurysm. And in that case, the main thing that we're doing is trying to manage any medical complications and monitor for secondary neurological complications, such as delayed ischemic neurological deficit. And in phase three, uh, you, uh, which only a subset of patients will reach, you have somebody who does have clinical evidence of vasospasm, and then your goal is to optimize cerebral perfusion um, to prevent delayed ischemic neurological deficits. So there are two different organizations that have guidelines out to help guide us um, in, in subarachnoid patients, and both were updated this year. Uh, so the AHA guideline, um, uh, yeah, encompasses a lot of things, including post-acute care and pre-hospital care and, and um, overall hospital systems. Um, the Neurocritical Care Society guideline focuses a lot more on the specific interventions that we can make in the ICU. Um, so both of them are worth taking a look at if you end up seeing these patients. 
Um, in terms of preventing re-bleeding, um, blood pressure control is uh, one of the only things that we really have at our disposal. Um, I was trained to keep the SBP less than 140, um, but the caveat is that if you do have an EVD, you want to keep the um, the cerebral perfusion pressure above that that 50 to 60 um, level. Um, so as par far as the guidelines go, there's not enough evidence to uh, recommend a specific threshold. So some people say 160, some people say 180, some people do what I was trained to do, which is 140. Um, we really don't know the answer to this, but what I will tell you is that there's increasing evidence um, in subarachnoid and in intracranial hemorrhage that um, blood pressure fluctuations predict poor outcome. So if whatever you're going to do, it's probably best to choose a titratable agent such as nicardipine or esmolol as opposed to IV pushes of um, hydralazine or whatever, because you want to avoid the rapid fluctuations. Um, emergency anticoagulation reversal. So if you've got somebody who's um, uh, on a DOAC or something, you want to do whatever you can to reverse the anticoagulation as quickly as possible. Um, there's no evidence for transfusing platelets for your patients that may be on um, antiplatelet agents. Um, and for a while, there was considerable enthusiasm about giving um, uh, fibrinolytic, or, uh, not antifibrinolytic uh, therapy, such as um, transexamic acid or amicar um, for patients with ruptured aneurysms. But a recent phase three trial uh, looked at this and found um, that uh, the patients that end up, ended up receiving specifically transexamic acid in this group um, did not end up um, having any improvement in functional outcome. And you can see the odds ratios cross one for just about everything they looked at. Um, though there, um, in, in some previous studies, there had been um, an increased rate of um, DVT and other thrombotic complications. So after the ultra trial, most centers have moved away from doing um, amicar or tranexamic acid in this group. So really, probably the best thing that we can do for these patients to present prevent re-bleeding uh, is to get the aneurysm secured. And usually, uh, you know, I'm not going to be the one doing that. Probably you won't be either uh, unless you go into interventional neurology, which uh, some of you might choose. Um, but there are two ways that we can do that or that um, neurosurgeons can do that. One is open craniotomy uh, with the placement of a clip across the neck of the aneurysm, um, or you can use an endovascular technique, which involves placing platinum coils into the dome of the aneurysm. Both are effective. Um, but what we found is that patients benefit most by getting um, the aneurysm secured as early as possible, and the, um, the best practice is to do it within 72 hours. Um, and there's a, there was a big um, trial called ISAT, the um, International Subarachnoid Aneurysm Trial, uh, which looked at clipping versus coiling for patients where both was an option. Um, and what they found was that over, um, you know, with 18 years of follow-up, the patients that got coiled had a slightly increased risk of recurrent bleeding, um, but the likelihood of um, survival at 10 years and specifically independent survival at 10 years uh, was be uh, better in the patients that got coiled as opposed to those that got clipped. So that would be an argument in favor of coiling uh, for patients where either um, treatment um, option is available. When we get into phase two, uh, so hopefully somebody has secured the aneurysm and now we are um, monitoring them in the ICU, um, the neurological complications we may run into are seizures, hydrocephalus, and of course, delayed ischemic neurological deficits, which are the major driver of mortality and morbidity in this group. Um, so seizures happen about 10% um, of patients. Um, there is no consensus regarding the utility of prophylactic AEDs. In fact, most people are moving away from that because it turns out that um, exposure to phenytoin is correlated with poor cognitive outcomes. Um, we don't really have a lot of data on some of the more, uh, you know, uh, what AEDs? Yeah, mo modern AEDs basically. Um, hydrocephalus obviously um, requires use of an external ventricular drain. Um, but the one thing that is fairly well established is the use of calcium channel blockers. Um, so nemotipine was studied you know, way back in the 80s and 90s because um, vasoconstriction is a calcium dependent process. And the idea was that if we blocked calcium channels, perhaps we could stop um, the, the blood vessel spasm that we see in some of these patients. Um, it turns out that when you give nemotipine or when they did the trials looking at nemotipine administration for subarachnoid patients, it did not actually change the incidence of radiographic vasospasm, um, but it did improve outcomes. And we think that's because of other calcium dependent processes such as excitotoxicity, 
um, and cortical split, uh, spreading depression that had been implicated um, in de development of delayed ischemic neurological deficits. So nimodipine um, is standard of care. In the US, we only have IV, I mean, PO formulations, but in Europe, they do have IV formulations. And I've heard some discussion that that might be coming to the United States as well. Um, one of the things that's, uh, that's kind of interesting that's just come out literally last month um, is lumbar um, drains might turn out to be um, helpful for preventing delayed ischemic neurological deficits in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this was a phase three study out of centers in um, Canada and Europe where they randomized patients to usual care um, versus placement of a lumbar drain shortly after admission. Um, and uh, the rationale for this is that the spinal fluid, obviously, um, you know, uh, the blood uh, cells and, and blood products are, you know, dependent for gravity. So that collects in the lumbar cisterns and that if we can um, drain spinal fluid from that location as opposed to the um, ventricles, um, then we may be able to um, clear a lot of those toxic um, hemoglobin breakdown products more effectively. And in fact, what they found um, was that they did show a statistically significant improvement in six month um, neurological outcomes in the patients that were randomized to a lumbar drain. Um, so I think that was a really interesting finding and um, accompanying the paper, um, they showed photos of the CSF that was drawn from uh, external ventricular drains in the patient that got them versus uh, the lumbar drainage from the same patient. Um, and it was really remarkable how much bloodier the lumbar drain um, sample looked. Um, so we are not doing this routinely at our center, but we're going to be talking about it. Um, and in a recent conversation that we had um, with some of the Southeastern neurocritical care groups, a lot of the others are considering um, trialing this at their um, institution as well. But the concern is um, that if you're placing a lumbar drain, um, and somebody with cerebral edema and possibly hydrocephalus, is that going to precipitate um, uh, herniation syndromes? Um, and in the um, in the setting of the clinical trial, they did not uh, have any complications like that. But of course, that is something that um, people are very concerned about um, moving forward with this. So unfortunately, we're almost out of time. Um, so I don't have a lot of time to devote to the many um, medical complications that you can get from subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, I will mention that there are a lot of um, cardiac and renal and pulmonary complications that um, frankly make this one of the more rewarding disease processes to take care of as a neurointensivist because there's really a lot that I feel like our management adds. Um, a lot of these patients present with fairly profound CHF from the stunned myocardium. Um, cerebral salt wasting is, is common and can potentially be uh, devastating if it's untreated. Um, and ARDS is actually a really um, significant factor in patients with um, catastrophic brain injury, whether from subarachnoid or traumatic, uh, with uh, catastrophic brain injury, whether it's from subarachnoid or from trauma. And this is an example of some of the EKG changes. You can see um, ST depression um, and S uh, T wave inversion that sort of diffusely uh, occurs. So this is the kind of thing that um, you Basically, if you see this in where um, in a distribution that conforms to a, a, a blood vessel, a vascular distribution, then that is um, concerning for a, 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 um, a coronary artery disease. But when it's diffuse like this, that may be secondary to your subarachnoid. Um, and in this case, the, you know, the patient got treated and over time those um, changes resolved. Um, but just uh, to mention a little bit about uh, the prognosis from this and, and to put a plug in for those of you that might be interested in neurocritical care, um, the mortality of, uh, of this disease is, is pretty high. Um, people are, you know, still estimate that it's about 50% based on autopsy studies where patients found out at home, um, you know, wound up getting autopsied and a, a fair number of them turned out to have subarachnoid hemorrhage and suggesting that some people that die, die before they get to the hospital. Um, hospital mortality is, is lower on the order of about 30% or so. Um, but it's important to note that although about half of survivors report cognitive impairment, uh, more than half of survivors can return to work within a year. So good outcomes are possible. Um, and I wanted to highlight um, this study out of Columbia University. So the table over here on the um, the right um, showing the Hunt Hess grade and how it um, how the mortality has changed over time. Um, so in the era when Hunt when Hunt and Hess first wrote their paper in the late 60s, um, about uh, 70 to 80 percent of patients with um, a grade four, grade five subarachnoid wound up dying during hospitalization. Um, and you can see that as of the early 2000s, we had whittled that down to about 50 percent. 
Um, and I do think that advances in um, coiling or endovascular procedures, um, as well as neurocritical care management, have really moved the needle on this. Um, I couldn't find a similar study uh, that um, kind of repeated this data more recently than than um, 2002. But I'm, I'm optimistic that you know um, the advances that my colleagues are, are making in this area are going to continue to um, improve outcomes in this group. And I think this is a, a really rewarding disease to, to take care of. So that is all I have. Thanks to those of you who stuck it out for the extra six minutes. Um, and- I have a couple of questions. Oh, um, all right, so first question was, should we standardize the use of a pupillometer? What do you think? Uh, so, so from what I've read about automated pupillometry, a lot of the studies they focused on, uh, they had two arms where they, uh, the main thing they were looking at was whether pupillometry predicted poor outcomes. So we know that if something's going on with the pupil, that is a sign of something going on inside. So yes, it does predict poor outcomes. There are only few limited studies, maybe one or two, which actually compared uh, manually checking the pupils versus automated pupillometry. And they did show that there was a difference, but I'm not really sure exactly what the outcomes was in that situation. Having said that, I feel like if there are dedicated neuro ICUs where you've got nurses who are trained at looking at pupils and who are able to tell definitively whether the pupils are reactive or not, uh, then you don't necessarily need a pupillometer. But in other sides, kinds of ICUs where there might be a lot of inter-rater uh, variability and the reliability is not as much. In those situations, I think definitely pupillometer would be very beneficial. Yeah, I think uh, I think you, you did a good job of summarizing it. I've um, worked at centers that use them and I think they can be valuable in certain contexts, but I, I think there's probably not enough compelling literature to uh, argue that we should standardize it for use um, in, in all centers, I guess would be the, the take home point. The next question is very interesting. What is the preferred method of decreasing ICP secondary to cytotoxic edema uh, from the CACNA1 genetic condition? And I am I'm very sorry to say that I have no idea. <laughs> I, I just quickly took a look at what CACN1 mutation is, and it's a kind of a mutation in a calcium channel, and the patients with this mutation are at risk of seizures and also at risk of developing cerebral edema, secondary to even minor head trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I would default to using the um, the modalities that we use for patients with other conditions with um, cytotoxic edema. Um, including, uh, you know, osmotherapy and um, deep sedation and so on, but I don't know of anything specific uh, for that population. So I'd have to do some more research, but um, I wish I had a better answer for you. And I think the last question was, can you comment on the use of ultrasound for optic nerve sheath uh, diameter measurement and also use of microdialysis? Yeah. So I think um, optic nerve sheath uh, measurement has some promise. Um, and I, I think the, um, the the real challenge with that is that as with all ultrasound modalities, it's somewhat operator dependent. Um, and when you're talking about measuring the optic nerve sheath, the difference between normal and abnormal can be less than a millimeter um, in some studies. So the, the problem is that um, I, I don't know that it is useful outside of an experienced set of hands, if that makes sense. Um, so I, I do think that there's um, a ton of promise and um, I, I would like to see us doing more of it at our center specifically, but um, there's a, a doctor at Michigan, Dr. Rajaji, who has done a lot of research in this and we had a, a session on it at the um, Neurocritical Care Society meeting last um, month. Uh, where his take is that, um, you know, as, as somebody who studied it, he doesn't feel like it's ready for prime time. Um, to touch on microdialysis, um, I think it's fascinating. Um, I think the thing to uh, remember about microdialysis and um, brain tissue oxygen, like from the Booth trial, and there's uh, there are probes now that you can do for um, 
uh, cerebral blood flow monitoring as well, um, is that all of them um, sit in the brain parenchyma and the, the area of resolution is about five millimeters around the probe. Um, so unlike ICP, which is a global measure, or um, back in the day when I was in training, we used to do jugular venous catheterizations to measure oxygen extraction fraction. So you could look at the venous um, oxygenation kind of like you do when you're doing a sepsis resuscitation or, or a, uh, managing cardiogenic shock um, to uh, use that as an indirect marker of um, uh, cerebral ischemia, basically. Um, and but that was, uh, you know, a, a, an indicator of what was going on throughout the entire intracranial compartment, whereas microdialysis, you're really seeing a very small region of tissue. Um, so that makes interpretation challenging, um, but there is some really fascinating stuff coming out of centers that are doing a lot of that, looking at the lactate to pyruvate ratio and, um, uh, you know, basically you can get some um, information about the efficacy of your interventions. So for example, if you're driving the CPP up and you see that um, your uh, microdialysis uh, uh, markers are not improving, that may suggest to you that uh, you need to uh, to reevaluate your device and, and see what you should be doing differently because you're not getting the effect that you wanted. So for example, maybe that's the person where auto regulation has failed. Um, but I think the challenge with that is that it is, um, uh, it, it's seeing a very um, small region of tissue. So it doesn't give you a, um, an indication of what's going on throughout the intracranial compartment um, as a whole. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much for your attention. I enjoyed talking to all of you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Shapshak. It was wonderful having you. Uh, Dr. Krishnam, I see you had to head out. We are so happy to have you here. Again, all of these will be recorded and posted onto YouTube later for your viewing. I would also like to mention, too, that we do have a neuro panel later in the month. I post the link in the chat. Once again, thank you for joining us today for AAN's Resident Education Lecture Series. Have a good day, everyone.